Hi, everybody. I'm John Nasta, and I have the tremendous pleasure to interview for The Doctor Weighs In, my good friend, Safi Ahmed. How are you, my friend? Hey. Good, so, good to so meet you. I have so much to say, but I'm going to shut up pretty quickly. <laughs> so you are the new rock star. You know, we, we look at digital health. We look at innovations. We look at at the empowerment of the individual, new clinical skills and techniques. And I got to tell you, you rocked both the social and the clinical world with what you did in the OR. So how did that day go? Tell me when you stepped into the OR and you've got the camera, you've got the equipment, and, and you did a VR operation. What did it feel like? What was that visceral reaction right out of the box? And we'll get to the nitty gritty stuff a little bit later. Okay. So, um, Obviously, a lot of um, uh, work that morning, making it work. A lot of news cameras, TVs, uh, a lot of staff from the hospital to organize. Also, you had a patient to look after. And that's the most important thing, right? You had a patient with a cancer diagnosis. It's emotive. He was turned up with his family for a major surgical operation, and not without possible complications. So my thoughts were really to concentrate on that part of the whole day. So actually, people ask the question, how do you operate with the whole world watching you? people interested around the world. And, you know, we went to 142 countries, for example. But actually, the good thing about being a surgeon, of course, that when you're actually operating in the zone, you're in the zone. The world just disappears around you. You're concentrating on the best that you can do. And I think that from that point of view, I could dissociate myself entirely from the bigger picture there and do the operation on its merit. I think it was helped by the fact that two years ago, I did a similar procedure. And I, I sort of understood the anxiety and stress a bit more this time. I'll be able to deal with it much better. So it didn't affect the outcome, thankfully, from my point of view. So you, we all live in VR. So you, as the surgeon, are in VR. Give me the perspective of other people involved. I know there were medical students watching it. I was watching it. Daniel Kraft was peering over your shoulders <laughs> and tweeting. What was the reaction from the participants outside of the, of the immediate surgical team? Uh, so we had a... We had a lot of feedback. We had a thousand emails in 24 hours about the whole project and things. And actually, the, the narrative seems to be a good one because overwhelmingly, it was a positive feedback we had. And all the people that connected with us afterwards, only one had a minor complaint about using the word virtual reality as opposed to 360 immersive video. That was the only complaint we had. Otherwise, people thought it was the right thing to do. They understood the connecting people around the world, making healthcare more equitable. It seemed to just make the right... Um, I suppose uh, it made the right answers for a lot of people's questions regarding global health. So we were really pleased that people had an overwhelming positive response to it. Was the reaction positive because of the novelty or was the action, reaction positive because of the evolved learning experience? Tease that out for me. Uh, it's a really good question. Undoubtedly, there's a wow factor behind VR. When you put a headset on, you immerse, look around, and we always get a wow, that's wow, it's amazing. Go beyond that. I always say that forget the first five or ten seconds. Let's think about what it's creating. So VR for me, the advantages for me, and I'll explain what the public felt about it, was the fact that you're in a team operating. For the first time, you can look around, see what's going on in the operating theater, see how people are behaving, interacting. We're obsessed with 2D images often. We always see what's in front of you the technical part of it. This was actually part of the team evolving how they work. So away from the wow factor, people were understanding, actually, hey, this is quite cool. We can see much more than we've been seen before. We can virtually be there and seeing how that team operates. The educational value of VR, I think, will evolve over the course of time. People will understand it better. They'll decide what value it does have going forward. So let me challenge you on that, because this is something that I'm, I'm curious about. If I'm a medical student or a resident and I'm looking at a bowel dissection, yes. to me, I want to see the intricacy of the technique. Mm -hmm. And I want a really optimized view of the procedure. Do I really need to look over my shoulder and see the anesthesiologist? Do I need to see the circulating nurse? You know. I don't know. I mean, again, that's where I struggle with the novelty versus the true sure. utility in clinical practice. Okay. Two things about that, of course. When we did the live feed, obviously we had one camera creating 360 content. Mm -hmm. We're also going to um, have another feed from the, the laparoscopic stack to bring that video out. So you could switch between the two views if you wanted to. We didn't at that stage because we weren't sure about the bandwidth, it was new, we were making mm -hmm. sure that we were safe. So in time, you'd have more than one camera that you can literally change from. So you can watch your technical part of the operation in much more detail if you want to, or you can withdraw and see the 
bigger side, the bigger picture flat, the 360 view. So that is that is going to be available going forward. Um, what's the second part of your question? Well, I just wanted to question whether I really need to look over my shoulder okay. and see the circulating nurse or to see the anesthesiologist. Okay. So, absolutely vital. We're obsessed with technical data about if you do an operation, how do you put A to B? And if you look at YouTube, the internet, it's full of those technical videos, okay? And we've exhausted that. What is a surgeon? Let's define what a surgeon is, John. A surgeon, for example, is someone who's making decisions, who's interacting with people around him, who's making decisions constantly based on uh, parameters like blood pressure, like pulse, talking to anesthetists, talking to his scrub nurse. And actually, if you think about healthcare as a whole and what makes a good surgeon, it's how he behaves in the team. We have to get away from this single episode of being a surgeon. And actually, I teach my, um, my students always to think about the bigger team structure because ultimately patient care is based around that team working efficiently. And that we need to translate. And I think VR adds the right medium to make that work. Do you put up physiologic data on one of the screens also? So can I see an arterial pulse tracing or an EKG or, or O2 sat? Any of that, is that something that is on the horizon or even relevant, or is it more of the, the surgical engagement? No, I think it's all relevant. Um, so um, the screen itself, when you show the 360, mm -hmm. one of the views is on the, uh, the anesthetic machine, if you like, looking at all the variables they change. We have tried thinking about getting data from the, from the system to put it into uh, via either adding the interaction onto the view, and that's what we're working on going forward. So yes, I do like to have the parameters, you like to be immersed in 360. Remember, when you've got a 360 view, a lot of empty space, remember, in the sky and on the floor, you fill it with information, with interaction. Actually, the next step of VR is how do you fill that space that's going to be of educational value? What do you put in that space? And that's where it's like an open source for us now. It's an open canvas. How do you make that work? And that's what I'm excited about. So I want to talk a little bit about the particular audiences that we're watching, but I want to take a step back, because you and I, were geeks, and, and we all stumbled around with Google Glass. So I want you to compare the experience of using Google Glass with the immersive VR reality you just did a couple weeks ago. Uh, a really interesting question. So the Google Glass was more difficult, and I'll tell you why. Because you're working with a glass suspended from your eyes. The glass itself... Although it's a great device, I still think it's one of the best devices out there. Mm -hmm. It's slightly above the level of your eye. It's sat just above. And so actually, people ask questions about well, how do you watch what you're doing? Well, you can because you can see everything. It's just slightly above your eye. So mm -hmm. it, it didn't obstruct your vision. The problem then, of course, is that everything you saw through the Google Glass was slightly higher than your own eyesight. So physically, you had to force yourself to look a bit further down so the viewer was getting the right view. Otherwise, you'd be missing the horizon entirely. That's what I struggled with. Also, you've got something on you, which is different to what you're normally used to, for example, and you're constantly uh, moving your head. So one thing is about having a camera on your head or your eyesight is that you realize how much you move your head afterwards. You don't realize, yeah. you're constantly, actually, so for the viewer, it's a bit like being seasick. So you have to almost physically stop yourself from moving. The VR, of course, is like different. I'm not wearing a headset. I'm not wearing anything on me. I'm just doing the operation. It's the video capturing everything around you. So actually, it's more in your comfort zone. It's not that difficult to manage a VR operation. I wish I had Raphael Grossman here to, yes. to challenge you about this. But Okay, so, so VR is immersive. You don't have um, um, disruptive technology on your head. Mm. But you do have the opportunity to have a heads-up display, maybe an overlay of physiologic mm. data, an overlay of anatomical or even pathologic data, you know, pathological mm. data. So do you see that as, as, as a, a part of an opportunity with that, or are they very different dynamics comparing the two? I, I think if you look at um, where we are with augmented reality and virtual reality uh, moving in parallel, yeah. but a lot of synergy, and there's this whole area of mixed reality. How do you create that area? We're talking about where you mm -hmm. overlay X-ray, CT scans, anatomical knowledge. That's all going to come in, in, in time. Uh, whether it's related to AR or VR, who knows? But actually, people do want the extra information, something that's more than just the, the video content itself. So help me understand who really benefits most from the VR operative experience, or at least from your experience, where did you get the most exciting reactions from? Was it nurses, medical students, consumers who've never been in OR, the patient who got to watch their own operation, attendings, senior surgeons? Where 
with that? How do you tease that out? And what were some of the interesting observations? Let's start from, okay, let's start from uh, medical students. Mm-hmm. They love the idea, and universally they support this because uh, historically they've always been at the back of a room watching the operation for eight or nine hours at a time, not really being engaged in part of the operation, unless they're physically scrubbed up, of course. So they suddenly felt engaged, and they were really excited by this new process. Um, I think um, trainees themselves were very excited because, again, they had the same thoughts about mm-hmm. this. Um, senior consultants were bemused by the idea, of course. This is new. How do we make it work? And they're bemused. They're, Use they're, the word bemused. Yeah, they, they enjoyed it. They think it was a great idea. Uh-huh. But they're questioning, okay, where do we take this? Yeah. I mean, it's great. It's, it's a wow well factor. So where's the value? How do we move this forward? What can we do with this? In fact, a lot of them were suggesting, as a lot of big companies, for example, that we often send surgeons across the globe to train or send them to conferences, for example, which is quite expensive and time inefficient. Actually, why not use VR to train people remotely? So these big companies, Johnson Johnson and, uh, for example, Covidian and such like, and Medtronic are saying, well, actually, let's just forget taking them out. So let's let's do VR. and kind of wrap it up. Okay. Tell me what the near-term and long-term future is for the application of these kind of VR realities in the OR, surgery at a distance, those things. What's on your radar? What do you think are the big things to look out for? Uh, I think one would be um, telementoring, training across the globe, scaling up so you can train more than one person at a time, making that equitable. I think in time, you really will be getting to the, use the idea of haptic feedback becoming more mm. uh, with more fidelity and more realistic. Um, the senses will be involved. And actually, at the time going forward, it's something I call the virtual surgeon, where you really will be creating the perfect simulation or as near to perfect as possible to create training that's just much more robust uh, and much more modern. Interesting. My friend, hey. always a pleasure. My pleasure. For The Doctor Weighs In, I'm John Nasta. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.